I was always one of those kids that loved to build things from, from a very young age. Um, I was the guy that was playing with Lego, playing with Tinker Toy, um, creating things that were just a sum of parts. It was a huge moment for me when I learned how to do teardowns with a screwdriver rather than a hammer. Um, and you could actually put them back together again. That blew my mind. Early on, for me, that looked like building robots. I started to love this idea of being able to take motors and sensors and electronics and put them all together into something that could do something and live out in the world. And I also learned that I love to compete. And beyond competing, I love to win. That was a lot of fun. I'm not sure how I won with that backboard, but... And I took this passion into uh, the University of Waterloo, University of Waterloo Systems Design Program. Uh, I enrolled in 92 largely because I thought that this was the best program for me to learn more about robotics and how to put systems together and uh, systems that could, that could go out and behave in the world. And this 320 by 240 pixel image here is the only image that I could still find of this project. Um, we produced, uh, at the end of our, our years, we produced the most advanced walking robot of its, of its scale. And this was a six-legged walking robot that had 18 different motors that were all coordinated by a microprocessor system. And it was the first robot of its kind that used industrial robot arm control algorithms to very precisely position a leg in space, but that was behaviorally controlled by behavior algorithms. So it reacted very organically to obstacles and to things in its path. And this, on the basis of this work, we got uh, tuition waivers and stipends to go to various universities, and I ended up at the University of Michigan in the mobile robotics department, building robots for the Department of Energy. And it was around that time that I started to think about what the future of my work might look like and the type of work that I was engaged in. And I didn't really like what I was visualizing in the future. Um, the Department of Energy was uh, a short hop away from military projects, which I had no interest in. And I went to Texas and founded a startup that was building personal care robots. And this idea of robots replacing humans started to really disgust me. And I thought, you know, this is not what I want to be doing. Um, <laughs> I'd spent all this time learning how to do all these robots, build all these robots, and it was just like, God, I don't want to be involved in this work anymore. So it was around that time that I discovered industrial design as a discipline. Industrial design, to me, was the connection between technology and people that use that technology. Industrial design is commonly thought of as sort of the look and feel around a product, but it's actually much deeper than that. It's about being able to understand the people who are using products and what issues they have and what solutions they are looking for, and then be able to match technology to that desire and solve problems, create new human experiences, remove tangible pain points from their life. So I ditched the robotics world and started over. I came back from Texas, back to Toronto, and I founded Cortex Design. And Cortex Design is a product design company, and I started looking for other clients and projects that were aligned with my goals. This is uh, one of the first consumer products that I ever designed for Cortex. And it's a simple idea. The idea is it's a scoreboard, so you can keep track of your score as you're playing sports. Um, and you can also listen to music while you're doing it. But what I was looking for was like, how do we make this product just a little bit bigger? When 
someone scores on it, and if you're the person that gets to bring this to your game, <laughs> thank you very much. And if the uh, opposing team scores, <laughs> that's disappointing. And it does all sorts of little things, like you, you have your timer that can keep going, you have, and you can play music. Anyway, and that idea, thank you very much. That, uh, that, that, little, that little hit uh, was tremendously satisfying. You know, it's that, that moment when the audience laughs a little bit, or you know, when two of you can bring an audience to your game, when two people can like, play a pickup basketball game and create this whole separate experience that is not possible without this product. That idea really excited me. As we went on, the years went on, we started doing bigger and bigger projects, and medical products really interested me because of the potential for all of these real tangible human pain points being reduced and real large problems being solved. In 2014, we were asked to help uh, our client, CloudDX, who is currently competing in the Qualcomm Tricorder XPRIZE competition. This was a huge competition. How many people have heard of the XPRIZE Foundation? Show of hands. Not too many. How many people have heard of SpaceX? So SpaceX was an XPRIZE competition. Uh, this was like the medical version of SpaceX, a moonshot competition to revolutionize access to healthcare. So the goals of this competition were very clear. A winning entry had to be able to monitor all five human vital signs all at once. It had to be able to uh, detect and diagnose 15 different chronic human health conditions. It had to be free of the use of, a doctor was not allowed to be part of this uh, solution. So it had to work with the person who was using it. And it had to be consumer focused. And for that reason, we visualized something that was going to fit on a drugstore shelf. And one of the key requirements was it had to weigh less than five pounds. So you couldn't have the suite of medical products that did all these things. It all had to fit inside a little box. And over the course of 10 months, which was insane, we created 35 functioning medical devices that achieved this goal. And in, in the end, um, as we were in the middle of delivering this uh, product, we flew down to San Diego, and uh, we were starting to put all of the algorithms together, and I was wearing it, so this is a little story uh, that I relate from that time. When we were working on the, uh, on the tricorder project, this was a vital sign monitor that could monitor all five human vitals, and, and um, I had just cut my foot early, like a day earlier, and um, I was in the States and I didn't have health coverage. Anyway, I was wearing this tricorder and, uh, and I got an alert that um, I was developing a fever. And um, our, our chief medical officer was there as well, and I mentioned it to him, and he was like, oh, let me take a look at that foot, and it was getting infected. So um, that was something that uh, it was intended to do, but it was tremendously satisfying for it to deliver on the yeah. promise, like right like then and the there, in this like in this in this very real sort of scenario. And wow. we ended up getting. I, I went to the doctor and I got antibiotics. It was too late to stitch. For the product to deliver in that very early stage, again, was just this this moment of realizing how great it was to have this new superpower. This was also recognized by the XPRIZE Foundation, where we were one of three winners in the Qualcomm Tricorder XPRIZE Foundation uh, competition. Uh, this is our winning team, uh, CloudDX, not, not Cortex, was the, the winner, but we were the design firm for them. Yeah. And uh, that was a huge moment. Oh, thank you. Now, throughout the history of Cortex, this one project 
um, has, has kept with us. And I brought this project to unveil to you guys today. So in, I guess, 2004, I met, um, I met a guy named Garnet Willis. And we were sharing, or I was sharing, his wood shop at the time, building furniture. Garnet is a sound designer, a professional artist, musician, instrument builder. And he had this weird cardboard model with him one day that he showed me. And uh, I asked him what it was. He said, this is a generalized microtonal keyboard. What is that? Uh, so he explained, this is for playing all of the notes in between the black and white keys on a piano. And I said, well, why would you want to play all the notes in between the black and white keys on a piano? And he said, well, a piano is actually always out of tune. What does that mean? Well, what makes music pleasant for us to listen to is the divisions between notes. And when you're playing notes together, those, those harmonic frequencies that are combinations. Now, if you divide a, um, an octave into 12 equal notes, this is one method for doing it. And this is what Western music is really based on. Now, it's difficult for a hand to reach across 12 keys that are playing these 12 notes. It's about as wide as you can go and still reach across an octave. So the design of a piano staggers those notes. It staggers those black and white keys. And this is what makes it easier for a hand to reach across. And that's about as dense as you can make a soundboard that has all of these individual strings that have to be hit by mechanical arms. And this became the de facto standard for pretty much all of the music that we listen to today in the Western world. But it is by no means all of the musical systems that are available. What Garnet explained was that right now we don't actually have composition and live performance instruments that allow us to play all of these other notes. So if you want to play something with 12 notes per, oct or 12 notes per octave as a piano, if you want to play something with 22 notes, 31 notes, 55 notes, there is currently no available instrument that you, you can compose on. So, why is that important? I mean, clearly we have a great deal of music composed in 12 notes per octave. Well, the thing that really grabbed me about it was, this is a limitation that we're artificially placing on our artists and composers right now. There's no physical meaning or physical reason for that limitation. And in fact, if you look at note divisions, integer note divisions, or frequency divisions, you can either choose to have nice intervals that sound nice on a, a piano, or you can tune your octaves to be in tune with each other. But you can't do both. That's why you can have a well-tuned piano, or a good piano tuner, and a, a less skilled piano tuner. They're making choices about what to keep in tune. That whole concept blew my mind. So, microtonal keyboards, microtonal musicians don't agree on very many things. There's a lot of variations in the available layouts, but they do agree generally on three things. One, a hexagonal arrangement of keys works out well for a variety of different tuning systems. Two, being able to use color and light to represent pitch and tone is a helpful way to keep track across a keyboard that is a completely new instrument. Keep track of where you are. And three, in order for this to be playable, you can't ignore history and the hundreds of years that people have been used to playing keyboards. A musician, when they're playing, they will use their, their body and their arms 
to push into a keyboard. And there'll be a tremendous amount of um, strength and velocity that the instrument absorbs. And you also have to be able to capture quite nuanced and delicate movement. So it's time for the big reveal. This is called the Lumitone. And this is a product that we have just finished, or sh we're showing people right now for the first time. How many piano players are in the audience, by the way? Just out of show of hands. Don't worry, I'm not going to call you down. <laughs> There's a few. So when people look at this instrument, most people say right away, well, what, where are those black and white keys on a piano? Where are they? So the way this keyboard is set up, it's set up right now for 31 notes per octave. So you can play many more notes per octave than what you can play on a piano. However, those 12 notes per octave are still available across the middle. So this is just one layout of many that's available. These are the 12 notes that you're used to hearing on a piano. I should preface this by saying I am not a musician. <laughs> so I can only make this sound as good as I can make a piano sound, which is to say not very much. But there are a few things that I can demonstrate that will highlight what makes this really unique. If you're playing a major chord on a piano, that will sound something like this. So there's three notes there. Now, if you're playing on a piano, piano players will know if you try and switch a major chord into another key, your finger position may or may not change for that other key. You have to know what your key signature is. On this keyboard, you don't. You can just keep that same relative position. And play it anywhere on the keyboard, and it will still play a major chord. Now, if you move beyond the 12 notes per octave, these are notes you can play on a piano, and these are notes you can't. You just don't have these notes available to you. To me, that's like limiting a painter to the number of colors that they can use. Right now, Western music is painted with 12 colors. Why do we have that limitation? So opening that up, these are 31 notes per octave. And you can hear all these other notes that you can play. One more thing about this. Now, now we have additional notes above and below on 31 notes per octave. What this lets you do is make chords easier to play. This, for example, is kind of an awkward thing for you to play, especially if you're over here and your hands has to be twisted. But it does this twinning, so you can do it down here too. So although there are many more keys on here, it's actually an easier instrument to learn how to play. Now, that's about the extent of my ability to play this keyboard. So I do have an example of what it looks like when a professional sits down and plays this instrument.
Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Music and human emotion are so closely tied together. The highest things that we do as humans is we eat, we have sex, we sleep. These are like our favorite things to do, right? <laughs> but what your brain does when you're listening to music is a higher elevated state of consciousness than all of those things, especially sleep. And in today's age, in today's world, for me, what I think is important and where I want to focus my time is creating community and creating products that um, allow us to project and experience new things that we don't have available to us today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.